Word, we've been talking about closing the door on the devil. And we're relating this to the ministry of divine healing because sometimes there are hindrances to healing. If somebody says, well, you're not one of those people that teaches it's the will of God to heal everybody, are you? Yes, I am. I'm one of them. But I also recognize, as do all who say that, that not everyone gets healed. But you see, what we fail to recognize, or let's say what the church sometimes fails to recognize, is that because someone didn't get healed doesn't mean it wasn't God's will to heal them. And we need to understand there are things that can block the healing power of God. I want to give you a little illustration of that that was very profound to me. Uh, I can't... I, 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 before I developed my policy of only lending my books out to people who I threatened to kill if they didn't return them, uh, I uh, lent out this book that I had that's no longer in print. It's, I think the title was Healing in His Presence. But it was the story of a woman who'd been miraculously raised up and uh, God had done a tremendous work in her life. She was not in the ministry, as we would say, full time. But she had been healed and so she started praying for people and because she wasn't uh, preaching in services, she would go and spend time with folks and minister the Word to them and share her testimony, share what the Lord showed her through the Word. And when she perceived that they were ready to be prayed for, she would pray for them and she got 100% results by taking time with them. But, but uh, she knew that her, her own pastor had a, a great uh, hearing loss in one of his ears and uh, she was praying about that because she felt she was so inspired by her own healing and the effectiveness she was having in ministry, she went to her pastor and said, Pastor, uh, you know, the Lord's been using me in healing and I really want to pray for you. I really believe God wants to heal your ear, the one that you're deaf in, and um, uh, would you let me pray for you? And he said, well, you know, I, I'd be delighted to let you. I know the Lord's using you and I'd like you to pray for me. So she prayed for him and immediately he had about an 80% restoration of hearing in that deaf ear. Well, now, she was used to 100%. She, was, she had been getting 100% results, complete healing for everybody that she ministered to. And so it really bothered her that she couldn't see full results in her own pastor. So she went to the Lord and she said, Lord, I don't, I don't understand why my pastor wasn't fully healed. And the Lord said, well, why don't you ask him? And she said, well, okay. So she went to him, she said, Pastor, she said, uh, you know, it's really bothered me that you didn't get your full restoration of your hearing, and uh, I just don't understand it, but when I asked the Lord about it, he said, ask you. And the pastor said, well, you know, before I was saved, I was a bit of a rogue, and I really lived a sinful life. And while I, I believe God has forgiven me, I really don't believe that I deserve to be fully healed. So I'm very happy that the Lord has healed me 80%. Now, was it God's will that He only be healed 80%? Or was there a stronghold of unbelief in His own heart that resisted the anointing and could only receive a little help? You see? I mean, 80% is pretty good, but, but you see, God's will is to do more. Now, just take that principle. I was listening to another brother share, uh, another man who was, in, who was pastoring, and he went to the hospital to see uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, actually, uh, I think it was a missionary that he knew. And he went to pray for him. And he came into the room. And as, as they began to pray, the minister that came to visit the man in the hospital all of a sudden saw Jesus appear at the end of the bed. And um, he didn't say, I see Jesus to the man. He said, Jesus is here to heal you. And the man in the bed, who was a missionary, said, uh, I know. And later, later told the brother, he said, well, I didn't see him, but I could sense his presence right there at the end of the bed, wasn't he? And he said, yeah, that's where he was. And he hadn't told him that he saw him. But he said, Jesus is here to heal you. And the man got out of the bed, went down and knelt down right where Jesus had appeared. He couldn't see him, but he knew he was there. And he knelt down and he said, oh, Lord, heal me. Oh, I'm so unworthy. And he said, Lord, heal me. Oh, but I don't deserve it. 
Now, that's not an exact quote of what he said. But he went through this about three times. And finally, the Lord turned to the minister and said, See, he won't let me heal him. Why? Stronghold of unworthiness. Really hadn't accepted what the cross paid for in forgiveness. How many people today do you think don't get healed because of a stronghold of guilt and unforgiveness? Is it, is it that God didn't want to heal him? No. Is it because they didn't have enough faith? Well, in one sense, yes. But really, a lot of times, it's more fundamental than that. It's they don't even really accept the forgiveness of the cross. Why did that, that, that pastor of that woman not get healed? Well, he believed he was saved, but not fully. He believed, he diseased, he believed forgiveness was for him, but not fully. See, we have to let the blood do its work so we are willing to accept everything Jesus would give to us. See? So sometimes people don't get healed for various reasons. And I think it's unfortunate that sometimes say, well, why don't you have any faith? Well, I, I figure for every person that says that to a sick person, uh, if you're not willing to take the time to help them through the process, you ought to just shut up. Yeah. Who needs your condemnation and guilt added to the stuff that's already on the person? See, I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, well, praise God, I had a headache and I believed for God, I believe God for a healing of my headache and so I'm an expert now on divine healing. And if you didn't get it, it's your unbelief because I had a headache and I believed and I'm healed and so praise God, I know everything about healing now. You see, we need, Jesus ministered in power, but he ministered in compassion. And if you don't have enough love to wash the person's feet, you ought to just keep your mouth shut. Amen. <laughs> just a little exhortation. Because we don't want to beat people up and make them feel bad. Well, you didn't get healed. There must be something wrong with you. I, have a, I know a man who was, has been in the ministry many years and he, Pentecostal man, in a denomination that really believes in divine healing, believes it's in the atonement. And he, he had a child born that was Down syndrome. And so many people came to him and said, well, there must be sin in your life, brother. What is it that you haven't done, you know? And, and laid all this stuff out, that he just was so wounded by that. He swung clear over to a, a view that said it was God's sovereign will and just accept the sovereignty of God. And has no faith for healing at all unless God's healed him in the last few years. But you see, how we treat people, is, it, it could be determining how they respond to God. And there's no place for arrogant, condescending criticism and condemnation in the kingdom. Now, there is a sometimes an occasion for serious, loving rebuke. <laughs> but it's like I was saying this morning that most of us don't like confrontation, so they're the ones the Lord will use to rebuke. If you like to confront and you like to rebuke, God probably doesn't want to use you. Because <laughs> there'll be enough flesh in that to destroy any spiritual effect. I mean, sometimes... G now, see, one of the things that we need to realize, though, is that Jesus said on many occasions, according to your faith, be it unto you. So it's not, it's not an inappropriate thing to say you need more faith. But it should be done in such a way that it encourages people to seek God uh, to deal with the unbelief in their lives. Not in a way that condemns them and makes them feel like second-class Christians. Because if you, uh, it, one one man, I read a little book that he wrote criticizing what I'm teaching you about healing, and he made an aside in the thing. He said, "Well, you know, if you rate the the ability to trust God in most of the church on a scale of one to ten, it'd be about a minus five. <laughs> so there is a problem here. We do need to grow in faith, but we need to tell people that in, in a way they can receive it." and be encouraged to seek God for faith in His Word. All of us can be exhorted to grow in faith. And if you're exhorted to grow in faith right, you won't be condemned about your unbelief, but you want to get away from it. You want to turn from it. You want to press on with God. All right, well, we've been talking about closing the door on the devil. Getting, dealing, we probably should spend some night on unbelief. But, but uh, we've been talking about renouncing occult involvement. We talked about soul ties. Uh, we talked, what did we talk about last week? Vows and judgments. Not vowels, vows. V-O-W-S. Things that we have set 
human level, human determination about some issue that we need to break in order to release our souls uh, into freedom in God. Tonight we want to talk about something, uh, another area that is helpful for people and it can have a great uh, effect on your health. And that is familiar spirits. <laughs> uh-oh, what do you mean, uh-oh? <laughs> now, I want to distinguish, beginning, starting out on this, I want to distinguish between uh, something in the scriptures that talks about those that have familiar spirits, and it's talking about mediums. Okay, now we have down here in, uh, uh, somewhere down south here, uh, a woman who has a familiar spirit. Uh, right. And um, she channels this spirit. That's a familiar spirit in the biblical sense of the word. But there's a slightly different aspect to that I want to talk about. I don't think your problem is your channeling in your spare time. <laughs> you know, except on your cable TV. Right. But, um, and that's channel surfing, not to be confused with channeling. Uh, but the idea, something that might be helpful for you to know, how many believe there are angels assigned to you to, to, to stay with you and to help you and to take care of you? In fact, I have a friend who probably uses everybody's out-of-work angels to keep him... Uh, I, won't, I won't get into that. No. I, I, uh, I'm finding that I need to be careful what I say about my brother, brother even though it's hilarious. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> and I don't mean it mean. But anyway, we have angels walking with us uh, who are assigned to us to help us, right? But how many know the devil always imitates God? And so there are spirits assigned to you not to help you, or let's say to help you do the wrong stuff. These are what we call familiar spirits or family spirits. All right? Now, I want to just lay a little groundwork about this tonight. This is the kind of familiar spirit I'm talking about, not the kind that people channel. All right? Not medium operation or channeling or that kind of thing. But spirits who follow your family line, whose assignment is to bring you into the family sins. Or to bring upon you the curses your family has walked into. And uh, it might be helpful if this is a new thought to some of you to hear some of the previous uh, Sunday nights when we've been talking about this because life is covenantal. All of life is covenantal whether you know it or not. You are always walking in covenant somehow or, or out of covenant. <laughs> or in other words, you're walking in the blessing of some covenant or the cursing of some, some covenant. Because all of life is covenantal. God is the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. He's also the covenant re revealing and covenant enabling God. He will reveal His covenant to you and He will enable you and empower you to walk in it. But all of life is covenantal and those of us who read the scriptures should understand this and recognize that all primitive cultures are covenantal. And in our day of modern covenant breaking, we're a little bit vague about covenant, but covenant is the heart of scripture. It's the foundation, the fundamental truth from Genesis to Revelation is God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. We have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. You see, the Bible is composed of the Old Testament or covenant and the New Testament or covenant. It's, it's a book about covenant agreements. Uh, when God said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believes uh, and is baptized shall be saved he that does not believe shall be condemned. That's covenant talk. Go offer them covenant and they can have the blessing of the covenant or the curse of the covenant. They can be saved or they can be condemned. Offer them covenant. And what they do with covenant determines their eternal destiny. So the Bible is a covenantal book and we need to understand covenant to walk intelligently with God. The most basic primitive agreement in, in, in old ancient cultures was covenant. They made blood covenants. Where did they learn that? Well, I believe, as do many others, that it was a revelation from God about the most sacred thing human beings can enter into with one another, which is a covenant. What is marriage? It's a covenant. 
It's an agreement to lay down your, your life with, for your covenant partner and it has stipulations. There are, there are really a number of aspects to covenant. We're not going to get too far into that tonight. But only to say that if I'm in covenant with God, that has certain requirements and certain benefits that God offers me. You see, a lot of times people say, well, how dare you demand of God? Well, if I'm His covenant partner, we demand of one another according to the covenant agreement. He demands my obedience. See? He demands my covenant faithfulness, and then He promises to provide for me as I walk in covenant with Him, whether it's spiritually, physically, uh, financially, relationally. He promises to provide for me because He's my covenant partner. I'm not demanding of God when I claim His promises. I'm being a covenant partner when I claim His promises. Because He has said to me that I'm bought at a price and I'm not my own, I belong to Him. He claims a covenant right over my life, therefore I can claim covenant privilege with Him. But the reality is, when Adam sold us out through his sin, Satan gained authority to curse in the earth. And in Luke 4, when Jesus was tempted, Satan said, Bow down and worship me, and all the authority of all these kingdoms I will give to you, because it has been handed over to me. Now, it wasn't ethical, but it was real. Satan didn't have the moral right to do it, but apparently he did, he, he did it legally, and even God keeps His word to the devil. Or maybe we should say God even keeps His word to the devil. And if the devil usurped Adam's sphere of authority, then God, just because He's more powerful, can't just come in and take that away without violating His own nature. But God did something in the earth. God established covenant with, uh, with, with the line of Seth, with Noah, with Abraham, uh, with Israel. And we see this line of covenant. And whenever men walked in the covenant, there was a divinely provided umbrella of protection for them from the curse that was in the earth. You remember the curse was upon the ground and it would, it would only bring forth out of sweat and toil. But for Israel, the fields would just blossom supernaturally, so much so that in the sixth year there would be enough for the seventh year and the eighth year when they started planting again without sowing. They were delivered from the curse that was upon the earth, protected from their enemies because they were in covenant with God. Now, if they broke covenant, the curse came upon them. Right? Right? And God said, uh, if you break covenant with me, that those sins will be visited upon the people to the third and fourth generation. Now, who do you think enforces the curse when you come out from under the umbrella of the covenant? Satan. And what spirits do you think enter the family line through the sins of our ancestors and attach themselves to the family, but those spirits that have been led in through the sin of our ancestors into the family line to, to haunt our families to the third and fourth generation. These are the familiar spirits. The family spirits. The spirits let into the family line through the sins of our ancestors so that they claim a legal right to torment us and to pass on their curse from generation to generation unless you get saved and loose yourself from those things. But now, what we've understood now relative to demonic spirits is that they do not immediately and automatically go just because you get saved and baptized in water or even baptized in the Holy Spirit. That they try to keep their territory. And sometimes they have to be, it's, the type would be the land of, of Israel, which was the inheritance of God's people, or the land of Canaan, was the inheritance of God's people, but they still had to drive out the inhabitants. And sometimes we have to, 
to drive out the inhabitants of our inheritance in Christ uh, by breaking the power of curses and assignments of the enemy and occult inheritance and all these things we've been talking about. Familiar spirits come into the family line on the sin, but then they enforce characteristics in the family line. You know how many people say, well, well, there's heart disease in my family. My relatives all have arthritis. Well, you know, three of my uncles had diabetes. Well, there's cancer in our family line. Now, I want you to think about that. Did God put that in your family line? No. no. How did it get in? Well, somehow it got in, often just through the ignorance of people, their sin or, or just... Uh, see, sometimes people go to a seance, never think a thing about it, but from that time on in their family line, there's a disease clinging to the family line. And so these kinds of spirits uh, enter into the family line, and you see, well... And, and I'll give you an illustration of this. We won't look it up, but it's in Genesis 20 and Genesis 26. Abraham goes to Egypt and fears that Pharaoh will kill him to get his wife. So he lies about his wife and says his wife is his sister. Right? Interesting. Funny thing is, in Genesis 26, Isaac does exactly the same thing. He lies about his wife and says his wife is his sister. Is it possible that he inherited that? You see it? See? I mean, that's kind of a creative thing, you know, lying about your wife being your sister. I mean, that's not something that would normally occur to people to do. But here's, here it's going right down the family line. Oh, we always do that. <laughs> we always lie about our wives. No, no, we always lie to our wives. No, that's it. <laughs> Who said that? Yes, yeah, get that off the tape right now. Get that. No. That's probably more common than lying about your wife. Anyway, things go down the family line and somehow we talk about them and claim them in ignorance. You know, well, all my family has bad knees. Think about whatever it is you've said. All my family fill in the blank. Well, a lot of my relatives fill in the blank. Okay? That's when you claimed your familiar spirit. When you said, all my family, blah, blah, blah. Unless you said, all my family are godly and have always sought the Lord. Amen. That's the heritage you want to claim. I mean, if it's true. But so many of these things that we have get passed down from fathers to sons, mothers to daughters. Curses, you see. Now let me say, God has already forgiven us for the sins of our ancestors. We are not responsible in the sense that God hasn't forgiven us, but we may still be inheriting because when you get saved, the devil doesn't say, oh shucks, I guess I can't oppress them no more. He still presses every claim that he possibly can. See? And so sometimes we need to deal with these things. Now, I'm sure in many cases, especially during revival, a lot of this stuff gets totally dealt with at conversion and water baptism. But sometimes it doesn't, and if it doesn't, uh, sometimes through ignorance, we give place to it with the words of our mouth and our thinking. See, if... Dad got heart disease and you're about 40, the fear of heart disease starts working on you to make the place for the familiar spirit to give you heart disease. See? Because sickness is of the devil. See, well, isn't it just natural? Well, it's both natural and supernatural. See? The spirits can actually affect your physical body in such a way that your body shows all the stuff the doctor sees. See, 
You know, some people say, well, you know, we gotta, we got to we got to do all these other things. Well, you know, it's good to eat, right? It's good to exercise. These are godly, godly things of responsibility. But uh, I was just sharing with, with someone recently about one of the books that I have on uh, healing the soul talks about this whole group of medical doctors who examine people who smoked, drank whiskey, and uh, ate all the wrong cholesterol stuff. I mean, they did everything wrong. Cholesterol stuff. You never. That, that's. You can tell I'm an expert on this. You gotta watch out for that cholesterol stuff. Anyway, they examined these two. This this group of people who all had the same bad habits, and they made this observation: the ones who were Type A personalities, driven, uh, anxious, kind of people. Uh, showed this tremendous capacity for heart disease. But this other part of the test group who did not have such a frenzied life did all the same bad stuff but didn't have anywhere near the percentage of the heart disease. Now, if you get the heart disease, they say don't smoke, you know, don't drink and eat right and all that kind of stuff, and it probably helps some. But the real deal is stress which the Bible totally confirms that a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Anxiety in the heart of a man weighs it down. You read through Proverbs and you'll find some of the best health advice you can ever get. But worry, fear, strife, anxiety do more for the body than all the bad eating you're going to do. I'm not advocating that you be careless about what you eat, but I'm, what I'm saying is we need to get these things in proportion biblically. It's more important what's eating you than what you're eating. Yes. Deal with what's eating you and what you're eating will not be nearly so important. And also, what about familiar spirits of allergies and food difficulties and problems? See? What about, uh, well... You know, my dad had hay fever. I have hay fever every year. I used to confess that regularly till God delivered me at the age of 21 when I read Jesus the Healer by Kenyon and my asthma ended. Now, since then, the devil's tried to bring on me another kind of allergy, but you know what? I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't have allergies. Amen. Jesus bore my allergies. Amen. Say, well... Uh, are all the symptoms gone? Nope. But you know what? They will be. Because Jesus bore my sicknesses and every familiar spirit has no authority over my body in the name of Jesus. See? Because I don't have to accept my natural inheritance, whatever it may be. Because God created your body to be well. So, well, what about all the factors of pollution and the additives in food? I don't know, but I'd sure pray over your food. Amen. You know what the Bible says God will do? He says He'll bless your food and your water and take sickness from your midst. Amen. You know what I understand that to be saying? When you sit down, ask the blessing of the Lord upon your food, and instead of making you sick, your food will bring you healing. Call upon your covenant when you eat your food. And again, I'm not advocating carelessness and I'm not saying there isn't any truth or benefit in uh, eating right and taking care of yourself and all of that. But what I'm saying is let's get these things in perspective. If I found myself allergic to certain foods or certain things, I would ask the Lord if it's a familiar spirit or just a spirit that somehow got in and if I can get rid of it and... and um, a friend of mine went to Europe uh, to minister and he has a real allergy to certain... Well, I guess it was... Was it wines? I can't remember what it was. Of course, now I hope you're sanctified enough to listen to this. But in Europe, they believe Christians can drink wine. I know, it's radical, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, now, they don't believe Christians are supposed to get drunk. But anyway, uh, my friend had allergic reaction 
to wine. And he was in France, where the Christians do not believe you should ever have an allergic reaction to wine. So this brother said, well, I'm going to pray for you and you're going to be able to drink wine. And so he prayed for him, commanded the power of that thing to go, and the whole time he was there, he, he drank wine socially and had no problem. Cool. Yeah. But I believe God wants us to appropriate His grace to deal with all allergic reactions to food or drink or wheat or barley, oats or nuts, fruits and flakes. <laughs> I'm allergic to weird people. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we need to realize that there can be things that have come down the family line that, uh, that are working on our physical health and may need to be dealt with at a spiritual level to release the physical healing of our bodies. You see, some people, uh, one man I know who really understood his authority, uh, not, I don't know him personally, I know of him, um, but he, he was traveling with another minister who was diabetic. And uh, he said to the man, he said, I have authority over that while I'm with you, and you will not need any insulin while we're together. In the entire two-week period they traveled together, the man did his regular test, found he needed no insulin. But about a week after he got back home, he started showing the need again. Now, folks, we're talking here about spiritual authority. We're talking about dominion. We're talking about dealing with demonic powers that cause sickness. We're talking about what might be a family spirit coming down the family line to haunt and to bring torment, disease, sickness, fear, oppression, insecurity, inferiority. Uh, it, might, it might be um, character weaknesses. What was it that Abraham gave place to that caused him to lie about Sarah. It was a character weakness. But guess who got it? Isaac. Well, all my family is afraid of fill in the blank. Well, we've always been fill in the blank. Well, none of my family has ever been able to fill in the blank. What is it you inherited? And, and do you want to stop it right this night? All right, turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. As we begin to understand our covenant with God and our authority in Christ, we begin to deal with some of these things. Actually, alcoholism can be a familiar spirit. An addictive nature can be a familiar spirit. I come from a line of alcoholics. And by the time I was 21, I was addicted to alcohol and marijuana. And I just discovered a, a perfectly uh, harmless drug that wasn't addictive and didn't cause you any serious problems. It was called cocaine. <laughs> At least that was the sales pitch. Yeah, you don't have to shoot it up so you don't have to worry about addiction. <laughs> Thank God I got saved or I really would have killed myself. But the thing was, Jesus, bam, instantly delivered me from alcoholism and drug addiction. Just bam. But you know what? Compulsive behaviors tried to show up in my life because it's in the family. See? Wanted to show up somewhere. All right? So what do we have to do? Well, we don't have to accept our natural inheritance and we can claim our spiritual inheritance in Christ because if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things are of God. So we can say, truthfully, I'm a joint heir with Jesus. I'm not a joint heir with Adam. I don't have to have what Adam brought me. I can have what Jesus bought me. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed 
with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Now, I think the primary meaning of that has to do with the religious traditions that were passed down. Uh, Peter's writing to Jewish believers. But, I, but the word tradition just means that which is handed down. And you have received some aimless conduct handed down. Aimless means futile. Uh, conduct that never gains any benefit or result that's good. So the futility of family weaknesses can be broken and you can claim your inheritance in Christ uh, overcoming uh, the besetting weaknesses and sins of your family line. And Peter says it's by the blood of Jesus we've been redeemed and so uh, we, don't, we don't have to have what we've been redeemed from. And of course, if you read Deuteronomy 28, the Bible says that you're redeemed from the curse of the law and all kinds of diseases are listed there in that curse. And you have been redeemed from the curse of the law. You've redeemed from the stuff that should come on you because your ancestors stepped outside of God's covenant protection and brought in curses. You've been redeemed by the blood. But it's not automatic. You have to enforce it. You have to take hold of it. You have to see your redemption. See that you're redeemed. Now somebody, uh, I heard a, 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 a man who teaches a lot about faith and claiming uh, the promises of God. He, I heard him testify. He said that he had some kind of allergy. And um, he said he took his allergy medicine for two years while confessing his healing and deliverance from allergies. And he said after two years of consistently uh, declaring that he was healed of allergies, he no longer needed his medicine. Okay? Now most of us would like just to do a quick prayer and never deal with it again. Uh, that would be probably real fine. Uh, but, but, but on the other hand, taking God's word and building it into your own heart and consciousness over time uh, really establishes something for you that's that's priceless. Uh, it, it establishes that a believer can take God's word, build it into their life, and get the benefit of it over time by consistently applying the word of God to your life. And 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 that's a very valuable and important lesson. Now we're going to pray tonight about the familiar spirits. But you see. Uh, Let's say, for example, this brother had a familiar spirit in his family line about allergies. Well, maybe the spirit was dealt with, but you see, he's still got his own conditioning. And he's still got the effects of what that spirit did on his body to weaken his immune system. So over time, he builds it up. He confesses the health of his immune system to resist allergic reactions and responses. And he talks to his body. It's an amazing thing that Doctors have discovered that people who talk to their bodies get their bodies to obey them. There was a man who, I don't know how this happened, it's in a little book in our bookstore, uh, God's Creative Power for Healing. He tells the story of this guy who the doctors told him to tell his body that his blood pressure was 120 over 80. Is it that the normal? Yeah. And so he said, body, I'm telling you, now this is not a Christian man. It's not a saved man. Not a saved doctor. And he said, tell your body that your blood pressure is 120 over 80. And so he did this for quite a season of time. And uh, pretty soon, his blood pressure was 120 over 80. And, and he said, I don't understand why this works, but apparently uh, your body doesn't have to understand it to obey. <laughs> well, if that'll work for a natural man... How much more the words of a covenantally blessed, redeemed child of God who's speaking God's word to his own body. How much more will that word bring deliverance and healing because it's not just a natural thing then, it's a supernatural thing because we have a covenant with the living God. So you getting what I'm saying? That, that we have to take the mentality that sickness is not my heritage. The latest uh, Reader's Digest. Uh, I remember an old minister used to say, you know, 
You've got to read your Bible and you've got to pray, but for heaven's sakes, read Reader's Digest. No. <laughs> I, I don't normally read it. I just saw it in the grocery store and it said, your faith can heal you. And it was talking about the doctors who are finding that those who go to the hospital for an operation who have faith in God spend far less time in the hospital and recover far better just because they have faith in God. And one of the things that they pointed out in that article is that worry, anxiety, and fear uh, cause your immune system to not function properly. So if you deal with anxiety, your immune system works better and you're healthier. And they're just looking at this from a medical point of view now, nothing spiritual. These are doctors who don't claim to be Christians that are observing these things. And um, you see, all it does is confirm the truth of Scripture. That's why it's so important for us to learn to cast our cares on the Lord because anxiety affects your health. And some night we'll talk for a while more about anxiety, stress, and healing. Because some people, their bodies get sick because of anxiety. They go to a meeting, God drives out the symptoms, and they're well for a while, and it comes back. And they say, I don't understand how I lost my healing. Sometimes you lost your healing because the way you got sick was through worry and fear, and you never dealt with the worry and fear. And so the same dynamic that brought the weakness to you physically was not dealt with. And, a, and the anointing came, drove away the symptoms, brought temporary healing. But over time, repeating the negative pattern of worry, fear, and anxiety caused the same symptoms to come back. So learning to give our cares to God, learning to cast our cares on the Lord, is a very important aspect of walking and healing and health and the life of Jesus manifesting within us. Amen. Amen. All right, so we want to tonight take some time here. And as I've been sharing with you, maybe some of you thought, you know, I remember my dad saying, our family always. Or mom saying, all the women in our family have always had problems with their menstrual cycles. Hello? See? All of this kind of stuff. Well, that's the way things have always been in our family. Well, you need to take authority over those word curses and break them. Because that's what it is. It's a curse. It's a curse done in ignorance. It's a curse done in unbelief. It's a curse done without necessarily trying to do evil. But you see, when you pronounce your destiny apart from God you always are pronouncing a curse. Have you noticed how that the most accurate demonic prophecies have to do with future disasters? Why? It's because they can arrange them. Seriously. But God wants us to learn to prophesy the blessing in our life. See, with our own, use your mouth to prophesy the blessing. So, let's take a few minutes now and, and you just, uh, whatever came to mind here, whatever you need to, to renounce and confess uh, that comes to mind. If you think about your parents or your grandparents or the family line or what are the, what are the family ghosts that you've always said, ha, 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 you know, we always blah, blah, blah. Some of you may want to, to, to we'll, we'll pray for our descendants as well. Because it stops here. Yes, amen. Our children don't have to have those things either. Amen. amen? So you just kind of think through here what it is you need to deal with. And in a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And then you can just, uh, we'll pause at a certain point. And you can put in whatever you need to put in. And we're going to break and renounce it and command the power of this curse off the family line to be broken. Hallelujah. Father, we thank You. Holy Spirit, You're here to remind us of these things. Bring to mind and show us what we need to deal with and 
uh, we want to break the power of everything, Lord, that you've not in- wanted us to inherit. And Holy Spirit, we just ask you to anoint our prayer and anoint our command of faith, anoint our memory, anoint our mind. And uh, Lord, as we pray, we, we ask that you would just witness by your power and demonstration, Lord. Hallelujah. All right. Those of you who want to pray this with me. Dear Father God, I understand from your word that my ancestors may have opened the door for curses on my life and the life of my descendants. I confess their sins. Whether they were done in ignorance Knowingly or willingly, I confess the sins of their words in pronouncing curses on my family line. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I break, smash, destroy every curse, every familiar spirit on my family line. In the name of Jesus, I take forgiveness for my ancestors. I renounce their sins, their unbelief, their unwitting opening of doors to the enemy to bring curses on my life. In Jesus' name, I loose myself I break every curse. I cut the cords. And I break the assignments of familiar spirits. Familiar spirits? In Jesus' name. Get out of my family line. I break your power. The blood is against you. I loose myself. And my descendants, and my descendants. From, your from your influence, you will no longer, you will no longer have, access have access to this family. To this family. I, judge I judge you in the name, in the name of, the Lord Jesus Christ. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> well, amen. Glory to God. How many of you were aware of a release? Glory. Amen. Oh! Glory to God. Add one, yes. The last Sunday night, we made room for the Holy Spirit to come and fill us with joy and bless us. And we, we have been asking the Lord uh, for increase in the manifestation of the Spirit. Not manifestations per se, but the manifestation of Him yes. to, to minister to us. Now, if manifestations come, we welcome them. But that's not our goal. Our goal is that the Holy Spirit would, would come and we would, uh, we would see what we were seeing some months ago and the increase from that as well. And so we're going to invite the ministry team to come and then anyone who would like prayer, uh, we're inviting to come forward. And if you want prayer for something specific, ask the ministry team to pray for that specifically. But we're also praying for the blessing of the Holy Spirit's presence and just that manifestation of His presence to uh, refresh, to renew, and to do whatever He wants to do. So you're welcome to come for prayer if you don't have a specific need, but you just want God to do more in your life. If your prayer is just more Jesus, then you can come and the team will pray for you. If you have a specific need, they'll pray for you as well. But you don't need a specific 
uh, problem. Uh, to, 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 you don't need a specific problem. And you probably don't want a specific problem. And if you have a specific problem, please get rid of it. Would you just... Come My sister has a problem here. Does she? Your sister, that's your wife. Out! <laughs> no. My sister has a... There's one at least in every crowd. You know that? That's uh... So we want to invite you to come and... Uh... And have the team come and minister. <laughs> and somebody pray for Abraham, will you?